Good evening, everybody. The talk is called From Basins to Prospect and the Learnings from a Lifetime in Exploration. Uh, I want to start with uh, an image that is very dear to my heart. This is the um, 1976 Carta Tectonica del Mondo with the basins. It was done by Bert Bali, uh, who was my thesis director at Rice. And, and the little stars are places I had the honor to work and try to understand the geology. Uh, it needs to start from the Neuquén Basin in Argentina. That's where I did my master's thesis at Rice. Uh, it was um, a study trying to relate the structure fault belt with the basin, the sequence stratigraphy with the, the structural part. And that, and, and, but today I will show you uh, east-west cross-section from uh, some work that Sebastián Galiassi did in uh, 2018. And, and here's a cross-section. Remember, this talk is mostly regional to prospect, and the whole point is try to understand the region. Here you see the photo belt, the volcanics in the western part, but the volcanics also here, uh, the on up onto the basement in the east, the photo belt over here, but today the most important part of the story is the Baca Muerta Shale. We did the uh, uh, in, in thesis, this was 35 years ago, try to understand and put into context this uh, important source rock, the source rock for all the high carbons. Notice that this is the only cross-section we're going to show where there is a detailed sequence stratigraphic study and makes the understanding of the basin a lot better. In this, in this case, the mapping of each sequence boundary as it goes from the Quintuco formation to the Vaca Muerta, and it turns out the best place to frack is in the maximum flooding surfaces. Here, to, to, to your right, you see a picture from, from this year of Pete Vale and Bob Mitchum when we, were, uh, we, we went bird watching with them. And here's Malcolm Ross right here. So, Sebastian, very instrumental in the understanding of the space, but also Leonardo de Garreta and Miguel Uliana that uh, used to be with APR like 50 years ago. Uh, some some cross-sections uh, in Africa, going from north to south, also older cross-sections to younger, as you'll see. Here's some line drawings provided by Gabor Tari. At that time, he was with Vanco. Uh, now, he is in Austria. Basically, understand the seismic, do some land drawings, understand the cross-stratigraphic evolution and the different units, both structural and stratigraphic, and then in place and show and try to understand where each field is located. Is it in the early extensional? Is it due to the compression? Is it due to the Romanche faults over here? Or is it purely stratigraphic? And that understanding is key to success. Another, another series of cross-sections going a little bit to the south, uh, Central Cabinda and Lower Congo in Angola. These two sections are from John Flitch. Uh, remember, I cannot show you my own work because that was all with companies and I obviously didn't keep them. As, as I moved and progressed from one company to the other. So, so these images come from Juan, and this one was published uh, at the APG annual meeting in 2009. Again, the whole point is understand where the Andola, the GC of the Mimbale fields, or more importantly now towards the present, the Jubilee, Twenemboa, and all the fields, all stratigraphic. This is uh, another one. I, I didn't have the chance to meet Tag Koning, but I would like to, because he, he very clearly thought and integrated the seeps in the surface with the understanding of the deep water and the importance of the salt and how these seeps on the carbonates were overlapping the granites. Where does that hydrocarbon come from? What was its maturity? When was it generated? When was it in place? How did it long distance migrate? Did it or did it not? 
And then understanding that, which is his diagram actually, it is not by chance that cobalt in 2013 had a 100% success rate in deep water. All these, why? Because they were drilling consistently structural highs and were mapping the base of salt. So let's go to the other side of the pond. Uh, I worked uh, for Redstone 2006, 2011, then at the Apache to 2013 uh, with, with Roy, we made writing even before that when we were BHP, and then uh, worked uh, from 2013 and 15 uh, at Sino. The whole point here is Repsol. Look, they have these blocks right here. They, they drilled a dry hole in West Appear. Nobody could understand why there weren't any high cars. So I said, give the project to me, I'll do the integration. We set up a team, we looked it all up, and it was clear. There was a regional seal that the extra cross-section shows quite clearly. And the hydrocarbons were being generated below it, and they were migrating long distance all the way to the outcrops. In Suriname, there are some fields uh, right here, uh, onshore, Tamborecho field and others. And in Guyana, there's lots of oil seeps right here. So we analyzed those. We did the geochemistry of that. And we noticed that it was sourced down here and it migrated long distance. We saw the amplitudes. We had the same PGS to these seismic when we were at, when, when we, the team we were at Repsol. We saw this and we said to Repsol, let's go and look at the farm out that Exxon has in the starboard block. Well, I, uh, Repsol in Madrid didn't believe in the Mesozoic, so we didn't. And so I moved to Apache. Apache was creating a new team. Instead of buying reserves, uh, developing fields that existed, they wanted to find new reserves. We looked at 200 projects. I proposed going into Suriname. We created the bid block, won the blocks, and, uh, and created a commitment. When I hear, oh, you don't have to do anything, you just shoot, shoot size me. That's not a very good idea. The good idea is to force your companies to drill wells. And that's what we did. There was two well commitment in, in at Apache. They drilled well, made the discovery. Not the first ones, but afterwards they did. And so here you could see, you could see the amplitudes. I know the side things really bad quality. You still can't see it. The whole point is understand the seal, understand the timing and the migration. We saw that at Repsol, we showed it to Apache, and then when, when we got the block at Apache, we're doing pharma presentations. I was I called up, they laid off. Tilly Chisholm, that was my boss, and myself at the same time, 30 minutes between each other. No harm done. I went to Sino, he went to Hess, we banged the table and said, we need to go and see this farm out. And we both did as two different companies. Tim listened, Sig Joiner at, C at, at CNOC, he listened. We both got that. A partnership of that Starboard block it was not by chance. That was CNOC and, and his. And, and, and look at the discovery. Here's, here's a little bit of a highlight of that, even in this really bad quality second image of a seismic line, you can see the amplitudes below the seal. And, and it's due to, well, the first well, uh, we knew what, or, or Hess knew what they were drilling, Exxon knew what they were drilling. Uh, th there was some amplitude APO work to be done to really understand the details of which one will have hydrograms and will, which one won't. We did that. But you know what? After that, it was easy. One trillion dollars in value was created at that time. And that's out of perseverance. That's out of doing your own regional work. And when you have a clear idea, bang the table, because we did the work. Oops. Let's go to a different area. I've been working in Mexico for the last 10 years. Uh, I created a, a, an oil and gas operating company with Juan Jose Suarez, who's a PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, an economist. He used to be the CEO of Pemex. And uh, him and I convinced each other to start a company in Mexico. We did. 
with uh, Saul Lopez de la Torre. Saul was in charge of community relationships for Pemex. We created a company. Look, this is an interesting picture. Because of politics, there's very different amount of hydrocarbons found. That's only politics. And the fact that for 80 years, only one company could explore and develop hydrocarbons, and that was Pemex. Here's a geology of this area called Tampico Misandla Basin, the Golden Lane. There's a, there's a well right here called uh, Potrero del Llano Cuatro. It made 260,000 barrels per day. 260,000. Yeah, right here. Okay, so, so we looked at this basin. I'm going to show you a cross section we did ourselves from here uh, west to the east. And, and it looks like that. We put everything we knew into this cross section from the folder belt, the erosion, the half gravens, the extension here right at the beginning of the offshore, the extension that creates um, the folder belt in front. Uh, everything we knew. The heat flow of the different uh, cross, the transition clubs, where was it? and the timing of the structural events and, and all, obviously all the stratigraphy. So we put everything new onto them and we worked with uh, Guillermo Perez Cruz, who was, uh, before was with Pemex, and then with the IFP, uh, Jean-Marie Ley, and uh, a guy called Guillermo Perez Drago. Well, it's actually Guillermo's son works for the IFP. And we did this together. We were able to to then do uh, sections where we could predict with time the temperatures, the maturity, and the transformation ratio of the three main source shocks, the Pimienta Shale, the Tama, and Santiago in the Oxfordian. So you can see from here, what was transformed? All of this 100% transformed in the, in the basin. This is the Pico Santa Basin here. So uh, this is, uh, we calibrated all the fields, to the understanding of the geochemistry and we could see where the fields that exist we knew. So these are the proven plays in the area and, and from doing this work we can see there's a lot to be found that hasn't even been tried. Whole trends that haven't been explored. One of them, for example, looks exactly like Guyana Suriname, untouched, not one well drilled on it. And, and so even to the west. But today we're going to talk mostly, since we started with Neuquén Basin, we finished with another tremendous source rock, that is the Pimienta Shale. Unconventional potential, the EIA says 90 billion barrels and 60 TCF gas remaining to be developed. And this is better, I, I tell you because I've done it, it's better than the Permian Basin. It's just in a different country. So I'm going to jog you a little bit. And, and, and uh, let's think together, how do we create electricity around the world? So how do we create it? So this is uh, from a database called Ember. It's uh, open data. Anybody can go in and it's done to be shared. <coughs> Look, worldwide, the last 20 years, 2000 to today, the coal to create electricity increases, gas increases, nuclear stay constant, the um, hydroelectric and obviously the green uh, energy is increasing here. So worldwide, what do you think is going to happen to gas? Is it going to be just stop tomorrow? No, you can predict from these that it's going to continue. It's going to be very important to continue generating electricity. Look at the US, pretty constant. A little bit of an increase in the last 25 years, but what happened? The coal decreased and the gas increased to double. Look at Europe as a whole. Again, decreasing in coal, increasing in gas, obviously increasing in the, in the green energy. And now, the third biggest economy, and by the way, if you add the US and Europe, it's what China is creating of electricity. But how do they create it? They create it mostly with coal. I've been to Beijing many times. Sunny day, no clouds, you cannot see the sun. Okay, last example, regional to prospect. Here's um, going back to the future. So let's look at the US and the remaining potential in the US. Here's a north-south cross section through Louisiana, onshore, all the way to deep water. Everybody's seen this section before. 
the alarm salt, the different maps of the alarm salt. We're going to look right here in the middle, right between the onshore and the offshore. There's an area of Miocene age sediment. They'll take two uh, slope turbidites that they'll take are above pressure as the shales of, uh, of the deep water start. That's when the pressure starts. It's totally related to geology. And the reservoirs then in pressure are um, turbiditic uh, channels. Very good quality. Uh, and what we do is we study this area in detail. We have all the seismic. We create prospects out of looking at ABO, looking at fields that have been developed in the 50s and the 60s. They didn't have 3D. The 3D came in the 2000s. And so we go back to those old fields and look for pockets where they hadn't, didn't have the seismic. We look for AVO signals. We calibrate to the production. And we create new prospects. And, uh, and here's a map. Shows right here, you know, uh, this is from El Sevier um, in the year 2019. So we're looking at this area right here. It's a great area because it has wonderful rocks from the ancestral Mississippi Delta and the slope right here. Okay. It also coincides, we're going towards economics, it also coincides with the area where, where a lot of pipelines in the offshore that can bring the hydrocarbons really quickly after being discovered into the system and into the energy terminals. Distribute gas and, and provide the gas to Europe. And here's, um, I know you can read it, it's on purpose, here's the 25 prospects. Um, we tabulate everything, chance of success, which is really, really high, the volumes, both in gas and oil, and then the TD of the well, how, how deep do we have to drill, what is it going to cost, the PNA cost, the completion cost, all the way to NPV. We calculate NPV from, from each one of the prospects and put it all together. So one TCF of gas, 60 million barrels of condensate, has an NPV 10 of $1.7 billion. And that still remains here in the U.S., <coughs> three hours away driving. Uh, rates of return in the, in the 200s and up. Uh, positive cash flow in the year two or three. If you only take the most important prospects that have most, most liquids and condensate, today the price of gas is a little bit low. Look, so 782 um, PCF of gas has a value of one billion dollars. We can't understand why this is, isn't being done here in the US. So, conclusion. What have I learned? First, do the regional work yourself. Do it yourself. Integrate all the knowledge from before, but then redo it yourself. And do it as a team. The key word is obviously integration. Listen to others. I tell myself this every day, so I remind myself. Listen to others. The opinion of the team is much better than the individual. Then take all that analysis and force yourself to convert it to economics. What is the value? How do we compare the value of one project to another? For through technical, even though the technical work is key and it's the most important, it's the first one to be done, it's relationships. It's relationships that make or break a project. And we all know that. And then it's about perseverance. People say, be patient. I say, no, be impatient, but be perseverant. Know what the objective is, understand the technical because you've done it, and then keep the eyes on the ball, which is your objective, and then keep swinging the bat. Play a long-term game. And last but not least, create moments of silence. That's when the ideas come. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Any questions for Pablo? If there's no questions, it means you're not interested. <laughs> we have no money. <laughs> What's that? The, these, um, so, so you showed some really good prospectivity on the map.
Mexico. We showed some really good MISCI opportunities in the Gulf Coast, right by the pipelines. Our use actively developing acreage positions and looking for investors and, and that kind of thing? Yes, sir. Good luck to you. It's not about luck. <laughs> it's about perseverance. In, in, in Louisiana, we're doing mostly middle and lower Miocene because that's where the best APO is. And that's when we can increase the chance of success. I mean, increase the chance of success. So, so Miocene works best. Yes, there is a whole lot of other potential too. But we're concentrating on very low risk APO. Well, thank you very much.